So I, I really am excited about introducing uh, the seminar series. This has been something we, we wanted to do for, uh, for a while now. We talked a lot about, and so I'm happy to see it, our, our kind of our first one being kicked off. Um, and so I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Marvin Grubala from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He's going to talk about uh, long-term prospects for science. And I've heard from Martin that he likes to get questions during his talk. So please, please, please uh, go ahead and ask questions as you're going through. Um, but before we get into the science, um, I just want to talk a little bit about um, what our center is, like the, that's organizing this talk, and, uh, and to just give a little bit of an overview on that. And so um, uh, Christy and Martin and I, we're all members of the Center for Adapting Flaws into Features. It's a new center founded by the National Science Foundation. Um, it brings together researchers from a couple of different universities across the country. Uh, but broadly, uh, we're a lot of physical scientists, uh, and our mission really in the center is to use and develop new tools to really build an understanding of how flaws in materials, which often are there, whether you like them or not, uh, they're kind of a, a piece that's there, whether, whether, you, whether you want them to be there or not, but oftentimes they can be, um, you know, basically be beneficial to material if you can understand them and manipulate them. So we're really focusing on trying to understand how the little defects you have in materials really play a role in, uh, in uh, you know, leveraging their function. So can we, can we actually use this as, a, as, a, as opposed to a flaw? Can we actually turn these into features? And so we develop an, within the center a lot of tools um, for characterizing uh, uh, of these material defects and understanding them. Uh, but we also do a lot of work in trying to um, build just general uh, interest in, in these kinds of, the kinds of questions that we work on, the kinds of problems that we work on. And we do a lot of that by also developing new instrumentation for classrooms that can basically introduce students into the kinds of techniques and the tools that we end up using and developing within the center. Um, so here's the faculty that participate in the center. So Christy uh, is, our, is uh, the head of the center down at Rice University, um, along with uh, Stephanie Peterowski. Uh, I'm here at UT, and Martin is at Illinois. And we also have uh, Jen Dion at Stanford, Ben Levine at Stony Brook, and Marty and Zaney at uh, Wisconsin. So really across the country, we have this, uh, this really wonderful group of scientists who are coming together to work on these kinds of problems. And so Martin's gonna tell you a little bit uh, about um, some of his interests today in uh, the long-term prospects for science. And so Martin is at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, he actually got his bachelor's degree at, uh, at uh, Berkeley and his PhD there as well. He did a small Cal uh, stint at Caltech uh, before actually starting at UIUC in 1992. Um, and Martin is uh, a head of the National Academy of Sciences, but also just an all around incredibly curious scientist who works on a lot of really great problems in biophysics and in nanomaterials. And so uh, Martin, um, I guess if you want to go ahead and share your slides, you can go ahead and get started. All right. So hello, everyone. Uh, you know, welcome to the first of the uh, CAF lectures. I'm, I'm really actually um, very pleased that they picked me. You know, they could have picked other people. So yeah, <laughs> I'll give this a try. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is actually not my personal research, though, right? As you can probably already guess from the title, Long-Term Prospects of Science, I'm actually going to talk about stuff that I'm not an expert in at all. So I'm not a historian of science. I'm not a sociologist of science. You know, I'm not, uh, and there are people who are experts in this and actually study uh, these things. But nonetheless, as a, as, as a scientist and, and even as curious citizens, why we do muse about, uh, you know, where could science take us and what things could go well, what things could go really wrong. <laughs> and it can go both ways, as we well know from, you know, from past experience. And so I'm just gonna uh, share some of the sort of things that I've thought about and, and, and sort of ideas I've grappled with. And each one of these ideas is like, is a single slide. Uh, I have given this lecture before uh, a few times uh, uh, at various places, uh, including a number of undergraduate institutions, institutions when I was a uh, lecturer for the Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society. And really the idea is that I want to stop after every one of these slides, after I've said my, you know, yagada, yagada, yagada. <laughs> and see if uh, uh, there are actually questions or comments or like, I don't, I'm not buying this thing at all. Right? Yeah, this is, you, know, you may think that, but I certainly don't. So that's really the idea of this talk. And I know it's really hard to do this by Zoom. So normally in the past, of course, I've given this lecture in person. I can run around the room and, and shake up the audience and whatever, right, to, uh, to, to get uh, questions back and forth. But uh, so I would actually suggest if you're, if you feel, you know, uh, you know, rambunctious enough to do it. Um, that you know, if you have a question, you can just you push the raise hand icon or whatever that way we can all see it, and just unmute yourself and just talk, right? So, so you don't need to put things in chat even whatever. I think this is actually a, the best way to do this would be 
kind and of thing. please do it because yeah. the very best professors don't want to just hear themselves talk um they want to get asked really hard questions and professor grubala is the very best professor so well, and, and so this is your chance you. to do it because exactly I am your, he wants I, you to challenge him. <laughs> right. so you're doing this as part of a class. Maybe you're creating credit, but you're not getting the credit from me. So you can ask me whatever you want. Uh, your your professor is not going to you know, care, even if you even if your question is so tough that I'm like, oh, I don't know. Um, okay, so let's get started. I'll share my screen and make sure that everybody can can see this. Um, let's see. All right. So you know, I'm starting off with a picture that uh, of, of our planet at night uh, and you know this one happens to be i'm from germany you can probably tell you know just by listening to me it doesn't sound like the uh, standard you know american or english accent so i picked like a, a a view of the earth where kind of germany is sitting over here next to france and down here is a little bit of, of italy and and you can tell when you look at the earth at night it's really not visible you know during the day that humans are making a pretty significant impact on, on the earth, right? Uh, you know, if you look at the earth during the day, it kind of just looks like the blue oceans and then some brown and greenish mottled land and the white clouds. But at night, you can see all the lights <laughs> from all the cities. And, and it's a pretty significant you know, amount. It's not like there's occasionally a barely visible little dot here. It's like, you know, a quarter or something of the surface is actually covered by, you know, various degrees of, of light. You can tell immediately where Paris is, for instance, right down here in this little slide, or London over here in England. And, and you can tell, I don't know, there's something about the Northern Italians. They really seem to like to have their uh, uh, lights on everywhere uh, at night. So uh, one of the uh, things that humans have done uh, to, uh, to sort of understand the world uh, around us is, is to develop this idea of science. Uh, and there are many other ways, of course, that people come to grips with the meaning of the world and how it works and what we can do. Uh, you know, there is like social interactions, religion. There are many, many approaches that humans have developed. But uh, the one I'm going to talk about is, is, uh, is science. And uh, you know, the, uh, these are ideas that have been around for a, a long time, probably certainly tens of thousands of years, you know, hundreds of thousands, a hundred thousand years or so. Um, and we can tell that people were scientifically curious, even from you know, looking at cave paintings in France or things like that. And we could tell people were thinking about, you know, how do we interact with animals? How do they behave the way they do? You know, questions of that sort. And, and this has been going on for a long time. And of course, you know, with the ancient Greeks 2000 years ago, uh, science became something a little bit more official. You know, that there were actually people that thought of themselves as mathematicians or natural philosophers and that were trying to ask questions about uh, you know, the very word atom that we use nowadays is, comes from the Greek atomos uh, for like smallest unit. Uh, and, and that was something that was coined by you know, Greek natural philosophers. Um, and then uh, in Europe, uh, in Central Europe, science was kind of uh, discovered or rediscovered, maybe one should rather say. Uh, in the at the end of the Middle Ages, you know, during the Renaissance, when people realized, you know, you could actually uh, in, take a guess as to how something in nature works, and then maybe make an observation, like look at the stars and see what they do if you're looking at astronomy, or maybe do an alchemical experiment and mix up stuff and see what what happens when when you do that. And then depending on whether the result of that matches what you thought would happen or not, that you can uh, either jump up and down and be happy because your little theory is working, or you can cry and go back to the you know, starting block and, and uh, you know, do some other experiment or, or figure out some you know, other idea that might explain you know, what you just uh, tried out. But this idea that we can actually interrogate nature, sometimes by observation, right? sometimes actually by doing experiments ourselves, and then that these experiments might match what we think might happen, or they might be totally different answer, right? In which case, clearly what we thought was not quite right, that we can then iteratively improve on that, right? So we take these guesses, we measure something or we observe something. A lot of the times the guess turns out to be wrong, actually almost all the time. So all the professors you can tell you, Science is not something where you know people guess the answer and then oh that's it and you know you just move on to the next thing. Almost all the time the guesses you're taking are wrong, 
Uh, and But eventually, though, that's the nice thing. If you go back to the basics and you say, well, the stuff that I guess, those theories, whatever, they have to actually match reality as best as I can determine it by doing measurements or making observations. Um, then you are actually making progress, right? The progress sort of goes and jumps and starts and, and sometimes things go pretty smoothly and, and sometimes they don't go as, as smoothly. And, and in fact, sometimes, you know, the, the results get reported in the popular press that scientists are talking about is like, maybe it's like this, maybe it's like that. And you know how it goes off, right? And, you know, you go like, maybe it's like this. And then the reporter says, well, very likely. And then the editor crosses that out and says, for sure. And then in the newspaper, it says, for sure, you know, it's like this. And then, you know, I'm sorry, but six months later, you find out no. you know, when we really measured this better and looked at it more, we found that that's not the case. And then, and then people complain like, oh, those scientists, you know, they don't know what they're, uh, what they're doing, but but scientists are used to this. As scientists, where you you know, those of you uh, you know, you can raise your hand if you if you want, if you have like, or, or you put a little hand icon up. You must have been in your lab in a lab course, right, in, in college or something like that, or in high school, and you tried some experiment and that the, the teacher thought would do X and it didn't. It just didn't work, right? I mean, that, that, there you go. I mean, <laughs> I can definitely put my hands up, you know, multiple times. Right, this has happened to me a lot. And you know, sometimes it is just because maybe something in the experiment wasn't done quite right, that could happen. But actually very often it's also just because the experiment really is giving a different answer and there's good reasons uh, for it. And you can actually learn uh, from that. And so as scientists, we're always prepared that, that the things that we look at or that we measure don't match our expectations at all. And that we actually have to revise our expectations. And that's how progress is made, right? I mean, uh, Newton developed Newton's laws and Hundreds of years later, we figured out that they're not quite correct, that, uh, you know, uh, Einstein's relativity will do a better job at certain things, quantum mechanics is at, at others. We still don't have a theory, by the way, that unifies general relativity and quantum mechanics into like one theory. So we know we're missing stuff that we just don't really understand uh, uh, you know, at all right now. Okay, so, so let me talk a little bit about a few of the kinds of conundrums that scientists face, both when they're thinking about science uh, but also in the process of doing science and how these things have sort of developed uh, over time. So I'm going to start out with this example here, which is very relevant because you know we are all thinking about uh, global warming uh, and and how this could have a strong impact on our environment. And not uh, and, and it's a real problem because even if the problem still is relatively small right now, like okay, it's two degrees Celsius you know, since uh, 1900 or something like that. Uh, if your calculations are telling you that, well, it could go to eight degrees in another 80 years. And if that happens, it's too late. You know, we're, you know, we're not gonna be able to react. Uh, and the reason is the earth is big, changes in the atmosphere take a long time to happen. And if you're screwing something up uh, and it takes you like 50 years to screw it up, it's gonna take the same amount of time to fix it again, right? And so. Uh, and you may not have that that time if, if things uh, you know, uh, run away. And so there are actually problems that are sufficiently worrisome and sufficiently large that even when scientists are not completely sure whether the worst case scenario is going to happen, you still have to actually take into account the possibility that it can happen and you have to act accordingly. It's actually worth then investing money and taxes and things into studying the problem and trying to find remedies for it because you know, what can happen? Well, if you get really lucky, maybe the problem wasn't as bad as you thought, right? And then it's not gonna be eight degrees, it'll just be three and a half. And you know, that's actually still pretty terrible, the consequences of that. But, uh, and, and then, you know, okay, you can, but, but, yeah, but maybe the more you know, uh, upper range of the uncertainty in the estimates, you know, maybe that turns out to be right. And then you really need to be prepared. And when you have really big problems, you need to be prepared well in advance if, if you want to even have a chance at, uh, at solving the problem. And we've seen things like this happen before. You know, scientists in the 19, uh, scientists and engineers in the 40s and 50s developed uh, these, you know, spray cans, but it was very convenient. You know, it's like, like you can spray anything out of a can, glue, you know, food, even, even like the, you know, the, the oil like, that you spray into a pan and whatever. And, you know, and used gases that were inert to drive this, but they were only inert as far as humans are concerned. Right? We were sort of worrying about, well, what, what happens in our little human sphere uh, and, and didn't realize that, oh, this stuff actually eventually floats up into the atmosphere. It's a gas after all. And an ultraviolet light can uh, break down uh, these gases and release chlorine atoms. 
And then these could actually react with ozone and therefore uh, break down a layer in the atmosphere that actually protects us from large amounts of UV light that, that can come from the sun. And, and people realized this, and by the 1970s, people were already saying, you know, this is like going to be a real problem. And, and people wouldn't listen. You know, nobody was doing anything in the 70s. But eventually, actually, by the 80s, the problem became obvious enough, and with observations of the ozone hole and so forth, uh, governments finally did step in and actually do something about so, it. And we did Martin, find solutions. Uh -huh. I have a question. Yep. Because I think you're the only, unfortunately, this is going to be an ageist question because I was um, alive in the 1970s, but I was a little kid. And uh -huh. one of the- I was a teenager too, so. I know, so you have just a few years on me. Um, one of the things that I've often wondered about is that was there as much pushback from the industry about what, whether this was actually the real problem and whether we should do anything about it, mm -hmm. or was the industry just so much smaller than, I mean, the entire world needs petroleum products to mm -hmm. function in a modern way. Mm -hmm. And so you can understand why there would be such a big pushback to making uncomfortable changes. Was there the same kind of argument and discussion or is the, you know, was it just not enough powerful enough, you know, stuff opposing it? No, I think there, were, there was probably less discussion than now, but there was certainly powerful opposition if you look actually at the news of the day and, and, and you know, the data that's available. You know, industry did not want to make the change right? because it's expensive. You have to develop new formulations of gases that you can use that are maybe better. And even those, right, you might find out 10 years later after some more research, there's a problem with those, right? The replacements to the replacement might not be... Uh, might not work either. And this is always how it's going to be. There, there was also opposition from some scientific circles. Right? It's not all scientists don't agree necessarily on, on how quickly things are going to evolve and, and on the data. And, and so this remember, is always a problem. You were, you were in Germany then, maybe it was very different, but I do remember in the, was it the 80s when we phased out leaded gasoline? Yes, exactly. That's how long that, that took, for example, getting but rid I, of tetramethyl lead. Right? I do and, remember and, in Virginia, you know, from the south that people would on purpose like modify their, they would take their catalytic converter mm -hmm. off their okay. car so that they right. could, so so you could, they use, could it. use cheaper leaded gasoline That's until. Right. That's right. <laughs> and so, but, but, and, but, and this is one of those things, by the way, that one really has to sort of take into account, right, which is in the end, humans do have to worry about economic interest, but right? you're making a salary and it might not be a lot, right? And you have to make ends meet and it's hard, right? And so then it's very easy to say, well, you know, if I as one person do this little thing, right? And it may not be like the, the healthiest or best thing to do, but it's still, it's Aiden Rani and, and I'm sorry, but that's how it is because, you know, so there's a lot of these problems that interleave, you know, economic problems. Uh, and so even if scientists think they know that, you know, something's going to happen or something's going to work a certain way, it may clash with, you know, uh, economic interests at every single level from individual people all the way back up to, you know, up to governments that have to, you know, uh, fund, you know, again, people might have to raise taxes to pay for something and they don't want to do that. It's not popular, right? So it's a very, very complicated picture in which of which scientists are really one piece you know, right, of the of the whole picture uh, as people who try to provide as reliable as possible information as to what's going on so that people can actually make decisions that are well founded right that's really the key and 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 this is one of the big jobs in, in science in fact i mean you might ask like why does congress or some place like that actually fund the national science foundation right and um, well, I mean, you know, at the risk of sounding a bit militaristic, but the uh, you know, in the 1930s, you know, the, the nuclear science was developed, and and uh, you know, there was the possibility you could make a bomb, and, and people realized this actually quite quickly, and, uh, and uh, the U.S. was sort of caught off guard, but they started this very large program, you know, Manhattan Project, to actually make make an atomic bomb, and uh, ended up getting it done, uh, but the government thought, you know. One of the things that the country needs is a source of readiness to tackle large scientific problems. They don't have to necessarily be military like it was you know, in World War II, but a problem like global warming. And when these problems arise, we often never thought about them before, right? Like 20 years earlier, it was not on anybody's radar, but now you know, it is. And then we need to be prepared because you can't suddenly start educating climate scientists or chemists or physicists or geologists or people who might study this from ground zero. You need to have an infrastructure that's already there. 
And this was really the motivation for starting uh, you know, something like the National Science Foundation to actually support science in, in the United States. Uh, the idea basically being that if we face big problems, we need to have people who are trained to think about them, right? So in that sense, I would actually say, uh, I don't know, Christy, you tell me or Sean or anybody else, but my impression of the NSF is not that it exists to like make my life easier and make pay me money so I can do research in my lab. It's there so that I can provide part of the infrastructure that actually has scientists on the ready in the US that can tackle almost any problem that you can imagine if we're faced with something uh, big. And you know, it was a war in World War II, but we have other problems that are equally big right, that need to be tackled. Martin, we have a, a student with a question here about yeah. energy. Yeah, let me actually go back to that slide. Which... Um, hi, so I was wondering why does it seem like it's more pushes being given to improving our current fuel systems like oil and gas rather than pursuing more like eco-friendly and sustainable energies such as uh, hydro energy, wind energy, or even solar energy. Yes. So let's talk about this actually a little bit. Uh, and part of the reason is, and I'll let the cat out of the bag, that at least in the short to medium term, you, you can actually have much higher gains by improving uh, you know, oil related things than you can actually do by, by developing solar energy. So let me explain what I mean by that, because that's, that's already a pretty controversial you know, you know, point right there. So I've got an example here that actually talks directly to your question. So, you know, when, when we harvest energy on Earth, essentially, ultimately, that energy either comes from the sun or it might come from the Earth's core, right, where there's also a heat gradient. So those are two sources of temperature differences that we can use. And, and what happens is, you know, sunlight sends photons down to the Earth that are yellow in color, right? And that corresponds to a temperature of about 6,000 Kelvin. So the energy in photons from sunlight, you know, the sun is actually a really high energy. This gets absorbed by the Earth's surface and gets re-radiated as uh, 300 Kelvin photons. So 300 Kelvin is room temperature, like, you know, whatever, you know, uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, right? something like that. And so this is a process that happens spontaneously according to something known as the oops, second law of thermodynamics. Uh, because if you take one single thing and you turn it into 20 smaller things, so you take this huge energy photon, you turn it into these smaller energy photons, uh, then there's more ways of rearranging those. That means the entropy, as we call it, goes up. And so that tends to happen spontaneously. You, any system tends to go from a state where it can have only a very few, small number of arrangements to states where it can have many arrangements. So everything that we actually do on Earth when we harvest energy is to somehow uh, make use of uh, processes that produce entropy, like you're burning gas, gasoline, right, and you're sending carbon monoxide, uh, dioxide and water molecules you know, out into the air, and you release energy at the same point. Okay? Uh, but it's actually driven all in, in, in the end, ultimately, because energy is conserved. Energy is always is constant. Right? It may take different forms. It's actually always ultimately driven by the disorder in, in, in systems. Okay? So uh, when we are doing, uh, uh, let's look at uh, this example here, gasoline versus corn ethanol, and then I'll talk about solar energy maybe as another example. So you might think, well, you know, uh, using ethanol from corn is already at least somewhat better because at least it's in a sense a renewable surface because you know, you're harvesting corn and then you're burning it essentially, right? To make energy. Uh, but then you, uh, you can actually you know, grow new corn the next year and that'll absorb the CO2 out of the atmosphere again, right? To grow that, right? And so you kind of end up with a zero sum game, you might think, right? But actually it turns out in, in reality, the, 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 it's not as rosy a picture. So if I look for instance at, uh, at, at just getting gasoline out of the ground and, and uh, turning it into energy, there's oil wells that have to be operated and, and stuff that has to be transported, gas and gasoline and refineries that have to be operated, right? To turn it into useful substances from asphalt to gasoline to you know, jet fuel, and whatever. And then that has to be transported. And then finally it gets burned up in the vehicle to move the vehicle and that it takes, and that generates actually a certain amount of entropy, okay, so randomness. And that's lost forever, right? The second law, there's nothing you can do about it. Once you've lost it, you've, you've lost it. Well, the entropy cost of doing actually corn ethanol, even though you think you're recycling things because you're growing the corn and then you burn it, but then it gets reabsorbed again at the next harvest and you grow it again. Uh, actually, when you look at all the various costs of the agriculture and transportation, they also produce you know, uh, entropy. And actually it's basically 80% of the cost. So actually what you're doing is 
by making this recyclable thing that you burn, but then you reabsorb it again at the next uh, season, you're still actually only doing 20% better than you did by digging coal out of the ground and then just using that. Okay? So the gain is not as much as, as you might think. Um, in fact, uh, the, I would say the, the researcher that I've quoted down here, uh, uh, Kyung Timkim, she's a chemist who has worked for this company you know, Chevron you know, for, her, for her whole life. I would say she is the single person on earth uh, who has contributed the most to increasing our energy efficiency. And she didn't do it by developing solar panels or wind energy or things like this. She did it by making the gasoline production process cost us less, 30% less entropy than it did in the 1960s or 1970s before she started working on it. Now, that amount of energy production is you know, a huge fraction of our capacity on earth, right? It dwarfs solar power currently and, and all of these other things. And so you have to ask yourself the question, given that we have this process currently, what's better? Developing solar power some more right now, right? So we can make some, can make it, which is 5% of the total, like 1% better, or taking 80% of the total or 90% of the total and making that 30% better, right? And that's the decision she made. I mean, I've talked to her in person, right? And, and uh, you know, it's kind of a question of, at least you can turn the evil into a small evil, <laughs> so to speak, if you want to think of it that way. But that can actually be a huge gain for the good. Right? Now, uh, you're totally right, though. I mean, people really need to spend more effort, more time on, on alternative energies. And so if I take solar panel, so I don't have solar energy here, but actually the amount of trash you generate making a solar panel, right, which requires refinement of silicon factories that use up all kinds of energy and, 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 and produce entropy is actually quite enormous. The same is true for batteries in a car, right? You may think, hey, I have this electrical car. It's great, you know, I'm not contributing to pollution, but actually, first of all, making that battery has an enormous pollution cost to it. It actually takes typically eight years or so for a battery powered car to get that back. Um, and, and, and the electricity that you charge it with, right, when you plug into the wall, well, some of this comes from hydroelectric plants, which is not too bad, and, and other renewable, more renewable resources. But uh, some of it also comes because coal is getting burned somewhere, right? And even those hydroelectric plants, right, you know, how do they work? Well, it's because we dammed up some habitat and the animals that lived in it can no longer live there because that's filled with water now, right? And, and we're releasing it at a controlled rate to get that energy out of the dam. Uh, so dams have their own problems, right? Even though it is- So a can you answer another question, Martin, related to, the, related to the question you got? Because, because the, the, the real answer I think is that it's complicated and my, by much more, much more immediate things than just what's the absolute best thing to do. So my question to you is, as someone who obviously has lived in the US for a really long time, but you're actually German and very much relevant to the modern situation that's going on. If you've been to Germany, you can see that basically they've almost maximized their solar and wind production as good as they can get practically in the country. But they made a choice when France decided to keep nuclear power, Germany decided to eliminate their nuclear power. And so that means that they are very much reliant on importing petroleum products from the global petroleum market, which, right. um, which means now they're, they're in a pickle and Europe is in a pickle because where do you get petroleum products from? You get them from the places that are making petroleum and now you're left with difficult political decisions. So what do you think about nuclear power as, do we need to consider that? Martin, did Germany make the right choice or the wrong choice or we don't know yet in terms of, uh -huh. of, of so that? I, of, so I'll say, I'll, I'll, so I'll answer this with the disclaimer, of course, that I am no nuclear power expert. I may know something about it and I've studied it a little bit, um, but so I think they made the wrong choice. And uh, which is, again, that's a somewhat controversial answer because you know, we all want to hear more about wind power and solar power that in, in, because they seem more harmless in many ways. Clearly the big problem of nuclear power is the disposal of radioactive waste. Right? And the reason that's a problem, by the way, to some extent is because of uh, uh, safety issues. You could actually make reactors called breeders that produce a lot less waste because they can actually reuse their own fuel. Um, 
But there are safety issues with that because you're creating materials that if they were stolen could be used to make nuclear weapons, right? And that's certainly not something you want. And then there are the environmental issues of, of storing uh, the, the, uh, uh, the waste product. And they're pretty compact. So in a sense, they're actually quite storable compared to other things, right? But nonetheless, they're highly radioactive. It takes 100,000 years to decay down to a level that's sort of acceptable compared to environmental background. Nonetheless, um, the reason actually uh, that, the, that nuclear power is un so unpalatable is because there has been a strong resistance against it. Uh, I think a lot of this comes actually from uh, like a generation that grew up in the 50s and 60s uh, that had to duck under tables, you know, for nuclear attacks and get th that kind of training. I, you know, we don't need to do that in school anymore, but people trust me in the 50s and 60s, this was like a school exercise that, uh, that, that kids did. And I think that actually traumatized a whole generation with the idea like the word nuclear alone is enough to, to like forget it. I don't want to hear about that. So Garrett, um, you put a comment, you, you typed a comment into the chat. Do you want to expand more on, on your comment? This is, this is why I think it's important to have a discussion about these things. Yes, exactly, exactly. Let me actually pop you can, you can, Garrett, you can unmute yourself and just um, speak up. You're, you're absolutely welcome. Oh, oh, got it. So, so basically, yep. so, so, uh, and you know, probably Garrett, that the speaker has a hard time seeing the chat. So I will tell Mark. No, no, I can actually see it. So this is okay. Good. Perfect. Uh, so there's actually a number of questions, right? Yeah, that's perfect. Um, yeah, go, go to it, Martin. So the big, so there's one comment here is the big problem is not that we can't do it. It's that we have resistance against it, right? Because of technology to safely store it and that, uh, and the question whether our current reactors couldn't end up making a Chernobyl, right? And so there the answer is actually, uh, you know, companies that had an interest in nuclear power have actually developed over the last 40 years, much safer reactor technologies that are self-shutting down that can't do the, those kinds of things. But there isn't a single nuclear reactor like that that's built in the US, right? They're only on uh, drawings on a piece of paper because the US hasn't invested in nuclear technology and hasn't wanted to build any new nuclear reactors in 40 years, right? So, so we are actually sitting on 40 year old technology and that technology is worrisome, right? Which is why they're shutting down as, wherever they can, eventually nuclear reactors as they age out. But you're right though, so that's not the problem. I think we have 40 years worth of technology gains that we could build much better reactors. It's, and sometimes well-founded public resistance on how do you dispose of the uh, waste can you do it safely enough? Can you handle this with things that are going to be sticking around for 100,000 years? And you know, the French solved this, by the way, by putting these, their nuclear waste in, in glass spheres and then dumping it into the Mariana Trench and hoping that it diffuses slowly enough deep down from there in the ocean. Right? That's, not a, you know, that, that's not going to be a problem. Uh, the US had a somewhat more, I would say, conscientious program uh, than France did which is to use uh, salt mines in, in, right. in, Western, right. in the Western United States that are known to be geologically extremely stable, you know, no volcanic activity or seismic activity or, or things of that sort. So Sydney, and, uh, pose, Sydney poses another interesting question that I guess, again, Martin, I'm gonna ask you about. Mm -hmm. So Sydney, you were definitely not alive for this, but again, like if you were a kid in the seventies, you mm -hmm. barely remember the Iran hostage situation mm -hmm. and the giant gas crisis mm -hmm. in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And there were very strong discussions in that time of weaning ourselves off of like being reliant on, on getting our oil from countries that might have very different ideologies from us. And you see that that's moved through. And at that time, we didn't make a hard choice. We made it an easier choice. What do you think, Sydney? Are we going to are we going to make more difficult choices now, or are we going to make easy choices? I mean, you're kind of the future here, not us. <laughs> yeah, let, Sydney, actually, give us your answer, and I'll, t I'll, I'll promise I'll tell you what I think afterwards, but without biasing you beforehand. Do you think, actually, that, that you know, like the situation in Russia that you mentioned, that that's going to help? Sydney says he hopes so, but money and power <laughs> talk. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> um, so I think actually that this is going to help, right? Because it's making us very, very aware of, of these problems. Uh, Germany, I mean, you mentioned this is a, is a good example, right? Uh, Germany has relied on a Russian gas now for a long time. 
And even though they may have gone solar and in other ways have tried to do put alternative energies into place, as you said, to some extent, they're saturated on how quickly they can do it, right? And so if a situation like this suddenly arises in a crisis, they're stuck, right? There's a good reason why the United States has been much less recalcitrant to put sanctions on Russia for invading Ukraine right, than Germany has. Although Germany has done things, but, but you know, they need to be pushed uh, by the US and by uh, England uh, to some extent. And the reason is reality, right? The reason is they are getting 60% or something like that of their natural gas uh, imported from Russia. And so it's much easier, to, much harder to turn that off. Uh, whereas the United States in principle has much better energy self-sufficiency than, than say a country like Germany. Despite the fact that Germany has uh, done a lot more to invest in, in wind energy and, and uh, uh, solar energy. And again, as I mentioned before on, on that slide, it's because Germany made that decision that we're really going to invest better in those alternative long you know, term future technologies. And it's, it's a good thing to do. Okay. Um, but we also need sort of intermediate term solutions like the one that you know, uh, Dr. Timken worked on, which is, you know, if we know that we still have to work with gas and things like this, let's at least work on making these processes as efficient as possible. And the gains you can get from that are enormous because that is such a large fraction of our of our energy uses. So I think Germany did the long-term correct thing and maybe did it even better than the US did, but they're still paying the price because the long-term correct thing takes time to develop and it certainly hasn't replaced their energy econ you know, economy and their energy economy is very dependent. And on they did nuclear when maybe yes. that wasn't the right choice. That's right, that's right. And, they did exactly. and they did nuclear energy when actually, despite the difficulties with uh, storage and all of those sorts of things, it's really something we need to seriously you know, think about because nuclear power in, uh, in, in, with that exception, right? The, the storage is a big, is a problem. It's, it's a real problem. But I think given modern reactor designs from a safety point of view and from a cleanliness point of view, it's really something that we need to think about. And again, we could think about it as a transitional technology, right? Maybe we don't want to be using conventional nuclear power 30 or 40 years from now, right? Maybe we want more solar. Maybe nuclear fusion will actually work at some point, right? These are things that are unpredictable to some extent. Um, but, but as a transitional technology, we might have to say, well, maybe it's better improving that and putting some you know, funds into that and really getting that to work while, while, while it can help us, uh, just like putting you know, funding into improving gasoline processing or things of that sort to make it more efficient. Uh, uh, and also invest money in that. So what I'm saying again is it's a very complicated problem. And yes, we need to push solar power. We need to push wind power. We need to push all of these alternative energies, geothermal, you know, there's a lot of these kinds of sources that in the long term are clearly better solutions. Um, but uh, we also need to look at what are sort of the transitional needs to move over from one kind of economy to, to another. And, and then it's worth working on improving some of these old fashioned not very good reputation things you know, as well. Yeah, and then as Garrett mentions, right, it's much more expensive to invest in new technology where you have to sort of really develop new engineering as well uh, than it is to basically just do you know, more of the same thing. Right? And that, that's always money and power in the end are what, but, and it's true at every level. So, you know, it's very easy to blame the governments and the people in charge and say, well, those evil people, in the government. but uh, I think the example that uh, Christy was giving that, you know, even we ourselves, right? If I have, I, I'm, I'm not super rich, right? Do I use leaded gasoline or unleaded? <laughs> and if I can do a trick to save myself money, well, you know, maybe I need to do that because I need to feed my family as well, right? It's not just, it's, there's lots of issues that we all have to take into uh, consideration. So it's a really, really difficult uh, problem, you know, the way to go. So let me uh, go to another topic. Um, and maybe instead of this one here, I'll, I'll pick one of the ones that is, I'll, I'll skip this one that's not controversial enough. I'll go to this one here, which is more controversial. So another thing, right, that where there's a big changes are looming, right, is, the extent to which uh, jobs become uh, automated in the future and the extent to which uh, things can actually be done by artificial intelligence or robotics um, and how that's going to impact humans and our quality of life and how we do work and, and how we interact and all these kinds of things. And, you know, we're at the very beginning stages of this, uh, you know, where Siri is helping us and we're kind of getting used to it, you know, and things of that sort. But you could imagine these kinds of artificial uh, agents taking over more and more. 
you might even worry from a political point of view, right, that they could take over in political or control senses, right? You know, when, you know, I mean, movies like, uh, you know, this is long before your time, but there was a famous movie in the 80s. Maybe people here have seen some of the sequels to it, The Terminator, right? And the idea was that machines become intelligent and then they want to exterminate humans. But I'm not so worried about that. I don't think machines, when they become intelligent, will want to exterminate uh, humans. But maybe, you know, there will be more control you know, exerted than maybe we want, or maybe then we even realize, or maybe the worst case, the scariest thought is actually that we'll want it, right? Because it makes life easy and, and why not just give it away and let a, uh, an artificial intelligence or a machine tell us what to do. Right? So what can we all replace with artificial intelligence and robotics or, and, and could human augmentation, that's the HA in there now play a role. And, uh, uh, again, it turns out the hurdles to making things like this happen are often larger than you might think. Um, so they can happen, but, but it's not going to be that easy to switch everything over to artificial intelligence. I'll give you an example here. Um, so this is actually from my own research, so I know something about this. We actually developed a machine-assisted diagnosis about 10 years ago um, where you can take a sample of breast cancer and the way they're diagnosed nowadays is that, you know, you make a slide of a sample that you take and then a pathologist looks at it. And it's actually pretty hard to tell. There's 10% uh, of false positives and false negatives where people get mastectomies that don't need it or where you didn't diagnose it and then it gets to a worse stage. So we developed a technique that actually in one second can take uh, one of these samples through a fiber optic. And uh, if it's got cancer, the sample will be red. And if it's not got cancer, it will be uh, blue, and the uh, differentiation between normal and tumor tissues is 99.9% .9 accurate. So it's 100 times more accurate than a pathologist looking at, at it. However, and this is assisted by artificial intelligence, right? So it's machine-assisted diagnosis. Uh, and But you, you are not going to find this at the hospital. How long does the processing take, Martin? The processing takes one second. So it's limited so this by... entire image analysis happens in one second. Yes. That's it's cool. Really, it's really fast. Right? That was the whole idea. So you're completely limited by the amount of time it would take to make an incision and do an optical fiber measurement or do a biopsy. That's how very cool. But still, that's much less than the time of going through all the slide preparation, the, the, uh, you know, uh, di the diagnostics from a. Well, guess what, though? If you go to Carl Hospital or wherever, you're not getting this and <laughs> you're getting the old fashioned thing they still, you know, that they were doing 10 years ago and they're still doing it now. And the reason is there are interests at stake. You know, for instance, this diagnosis here could actually be done by a nurse assistant, right? Because it's blue versus red. You don't need to have 10 years of training in pathological pathology slide analysis. No, this would be something that would be very useful because that's the thing you're saying that the expertise of the say the radiation oncologist to take all that careful time to go through the analysis to figure out is not a good expenditure of their, right. of their you know, training and expertise. Time. That's right, it's not a good expenditure of their time. It could be spent in other ways. But as you can imagine though, oncologists are people too. And so if you're basically saying that, hey, we can get rid of part of your job, they are not really, they're not jumping up and down <laughs> at, at the idea, even if their job has many other parts you know, that they, they could be doing. So it's not just, you know, we hear all these examples usually about, well, truck drivers will disappear, right? Because we'll have trucks driving autonomously on freeways. But that's actually, it's not, it's at every single level, all the way up to the highest level of you know, professions where people study for 10, 20 years, right? To get into the profession like medicine, right? It's a very, very sophisticated thing uh, that the ramifications of this go. And we're going to have to There's make, also, uh, I mean, the other thing that I think is interesting. So, well, Sydney asks, is the machine assisted diagnosis able to determine harmful versus non harmful? Mm -hmm. And how expensive would it, this be to put into hospitals? Yeah. So, this machine diagnosis is 99.9% of false, I guess, mean, so 0.1%, you know, false positives or false negatives. Uh, for tumors that uh, turn out to be later uh, um, uh, 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 real, you know, deadly lesions, not benign uh, tumors. So it's, it has that efficiency. Um, how expensive would it be to put into hospitals? So the prototype of this instrument cost about $500,000, right? Because it had to be all hand built and everything. Uh, my guess is if you went into serious production, you could probably build it for half that. Um, and, and so on the cost of hospital machinery, right? 
which you know an yeah. MRI, right? That's a yeah, compared to an MRI, this is right? cheap. That's like a multi millions of dollar instrument, right? Cool. This would actually be a cheap one, right? It's like but, it's kind of the cost of ultrasound diagnostics or something like that. Is, is the the real question though is uh, is this is very similar to the um to the what to do about petroleum products question is the stuff that's more complicated, like the legal implications, you know, look at automated cars, right? We have, you know, getting injured in a car accident is one of the like highest things that happens um, in terms of death and, and serious injury in our country. But those injuries are all caused by people. And that's something that people are willing to, to deal with, that there's even one death or injury caused by a computer. And that's the same thing here. You know, doctors make mistakes exactly. all exactly. the time, comparatively speaking. If a computer makes one mistake, then suddenly that's a much more ethically questionable yes. situation. Yes. And this is actually something that really we're going to have to spend a lot of, of uh, time and effort you know, thinking about. Our current insurance system, for instance, is really not workable, right, for this, for this kind of thing. Uh, now, the good news is, though, I mean, so just to give you an estimate, right, I mean, and these are pretty well-known numbers, if we actually were able to convert the U.S. over to a driverless system that's more or less, you know, uh, uh, driven by computer, it is estimated, and I think these estimates are reasonable, that the number of deaths would go down from about 30,000 to about 3,000 a year, so a factor of 10. So computers are going to make mistakes, right? I mean, it's unavoidable. We have to just live with that idea. Uh, but at that point, you would actually be much better off having a common insurance system to uh, um, deal with these cases, right? Because you have 3,000 cases a year, uh, and, and you basically say it's no fault, the computer did it, but somebody should pay, right? Because, you know, you would normally sue, and you would actually get money from, from insurance. A system needs to be set up that basically does that, right? And it would be, by the way, it would be enormously less costly than the system we have right now, because if you actually think of all the lawyers' fees and so forth, all, you know, all, everything that's involved in actually getting these cases, you know, through court, um, it's an enormous, uh, staggering cost. But again, it's not going to be easy to make things like this happen because, you know, uh, the people involved are not stupid, and they realize, wait a second, part of my livelihood is at stake now here, right? Because if they can uh, have a, an insurance scheme that is, let's say, no-fault insurance for computer-driven accidents, right, that would actually take care of this problem. Then but, also there are no humans involved in the litigation or any of these things anymore. And so, hey. But there's that? other places, though. So Sidney makes a, a good point. But the thing I think that's more interesting, so the talk that I heard about this, these statistics from the Israeli person who's who's invented their automated car system, is that the real problem though, even though it would, well, there's legal stuff and insurance stuff, is that the way that humans make our decisions, mm -hmm. making them non-logically actually is built into some, like, like you couldn't merge on a highway if you use pure computer logic. Like people have to do things like in the moment, break the rules. And mm -hmm. the other place I think that has really resisted automation, that's the perfect example, is um, home base, home plate umpiring in baseball. Like all you have to do is look and see that the, like the computer is so much better at calling balls and strikes mm -hmm. than the umpire. But the problem is, is that messing with the strike zone either if you're a batter or you're a pitcher or you're a catcher is mm. part of baseball. Like right. expanding or shrinking the strike zone from where it's supposed to be is part of baseball. If you eliminate that, then you've eliminated like part of part of the reason to play baseball. And so right, because, it's exactly complicated because and just- exactly. exactly, it's a human <laughs> sport, right? We're doing it because it's a sport, not because it's supposed to be some kind of uh, automated thing. Now, uh, Sydney's question, by the way, though, I think what you're proposing is probably the most realistic so solution is, um, and, and, and actually, as a general conclusion from my talk here, I think one of the takeaway ideas is what, what Sydney is saying there is, you can't make good things happen, even if they're mostly good, but right? nothing is ever 100% good, but if they're 99% you know, good in one step, it just doesn't work. And the reason is, even if they're good, it, it impacts negatively some aspect of life of someone, right? And, and those people will, of course, oppose this. And so I think the way to come to solutions is always to find a path that basically allows something to be done, but in a way that doesn't threaten, right? 
and uh, then see that it works and then let the system more organically evolve. Because if you give people time, right, eventually if there are a few trucks on the road that drive themselves, or as, as uh, Sydney's saying, if this kind of device could be used in the field at Christie Clinic as a pretest, right? But then you still have to go to the pathologist, right? And you set it up that way. Then you're giving the system a chance to organically evolve, where eventually maybe it becomes clear, like, well, wait a second, this thing is almost always right. So maybe pathologists do other things, or maybe the hospital won't hire one when somebody retires, right? And so you can then make these things actually. Uh, yeah. So Amy asks uh, like a oh, question Amy that had people a question, have been yes. asking throughout time. So Martin, do you want to address that one? Yeah, so, so, so she's basically saying, I mean, <laughs> we're slowly, oh, hold on. So let me go to Amy Nisey's question first, right? So with growing reliance on tech, is there any concern of humans using practical skills that are done by tech in our stead? So the answer is, well, this has been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. Like how many of us here actually know how to make fire uh, without anything, just sticks, right? And not even a Flintstone, just wooden sticks, let's say, or something. Hardly anybody. I mean, maybe somebody here is a, like a survivalist fan of studies. I mean, we can learn it, right? If we want, it's known how to do it. But most of us can. And this is true for most of the things. Exactly. So Garrett says, uh, you, know, you, know how, you know how to do it, but I don't know how to do it. But I, I've seen it even move. So in principle, I guess I can't, you know, but my guess is it wouldn't work anything like it does in the movies if I tried it, right? Uh, and I'm sure you know, Garrett would say like, yeah, that's, it's not, you know, not that obvious and simple. Um, so, you know, People are losing skills, and we have been losing skills for a long time as we build devices, right? Now, how many people don't know how to drive a car or a clutch, right? But, but who would want to, right? Because we have automatic transmissions that work really well. So we're continuously using skills. We're also gaining new skills. So there are certainly things that we know how to do that people couldn't even conceive 50 years ago because they didn't have uh, 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 you know, uh, smartphones or other kinds of things that work. we can actually apply our skills. So we lose skills and we gain skills. And I think the real danger is if there were a total collapse of the system, then we'd be in trouble, right? Because you might have to go back to very basic skills and those are few and far between as far as you know, people who know them. Uh, but there are always people around who, who uh, there's actually a book that just came out that's, that I could recommend to everyone. I, I haven't gotten a copy of it yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm about to order it. Um, that is basically sort of a book on, you know, here's like lost skills that humans have had, you know, as far as going far back in time. And here's how this actually worked, right? To just have it in like one place where you can see all of these, you know, neat things that, that humans have come up with. Um, so so we're, we're losing gears, we're, we're gaining skills, obviously in, in some kind of a disaster where a lot of our very sophisticated infrastructure, electricity, communication, all of that breaks down. Yes, we are going to be in deep trouble because of skills that we have lost that would have allowed us to function better without that, that uh, infrastructure existing. Um, and then uh, Sydney was talking about uh, introducing ultrasound into the field now to help it exactly. And so uh, and ultrasound is a good example because it's actually at the same cost point than this kind of device, uh, which is you use it for things that are relatively non-committal uh, originally like uh, determining a baby's sex or something like that. But then as the technology progresses and it's able to do more, you sort of use it for more applications and you do it again in a piecewise fashion. I think the secret here really is that when we have great ideas, we have to understand that you can't just suddenly go from zero to 100% you know, at once. You need to really figure out mechanisms that work around the human aspect to sort of do things step by step. And this goes in, so, so actually somebody earlier was saying about, well, there's too much talk, right? And, and we need action. Well, so that's true. Uh, you know, we, we do need action in the end, but actually the only way ultimately you can get that action is by having a lot of talk and by having people be comfortable with the action. And I think often people want to do something revolutionary, overlook that, you know, the need that, well, we have this great thing that we could do, but to actually make it happen, we need to compromise with a bunch of different people and, and make it happen sort of in steps until we can get to the point uh, where it is the thing that we wanted. And that's very hard to do, right? Because if you have something that you know it works and you know it's really gonna be great, you don't want to do it in little piecemeal steps. You really just want to you know, get the whole thing going. In that sense, for instance, the automated car industry was way too optimistic, right? As far as the estimates of how quickly this is gonna work and it's, it's gonna be accepted. Because sure, if everybody agreed and we just switched all the cars to autonomous, we could probably even do it right now because then you wouldn't have the human element as much to also worry about while you're dealing with an autonomous uh, vehicle. But we have the human element. And so it's gotta be done in a much more piecemeal fashion. And I think they have finally understood that that's what's gonna be the case. Um, so there was one more here. Uh, let me see. Um, 
Oh yeah, Amy was com uh, uh, Christy was commenting on Amy's uh, uh, question that our military has identified our reliance on GPS software. That's a good thing, right? A, a good one, a good example. Um, like uh, I still don't rely on GPS software, right? But that's only because I'm an old guy, right? And I actually learned I can look at a map and memorize it immediately. And from then on, I know exactly where all the streets are, and I can just find my way around, right? And if you did that a lot when you were a kid, then you're used to it, and that's just how you think about, you know, navigating, right? And so I don't use, I, I don't need GPS because I know where I need to go and, and how to find it. Uh, but again, that's a skill you learn by practice, right? And if you don't need it, well, you're not going to learn it because if you, now it's very convenient, right? You have that phone, and it just shows you a little blue line of uh, where to go. And so if that breaks down. Well, then some of us really are going to be sort of a little helpless because it's like, whoa, you know, how do I find even the spot where I'm supposed to go? And GPS has completely infiltrated our economy. It's not just people finding places to go to, right? The economy relies on it by locating things and how they get transported and how they move. Like our entire transportation and delivery system for packing, you know, all of the stuff would completely break down if we didn't actually have a GPS available. And we also have to remember, it's a bunch of satellites up there, right? They could get hit by space debris, or they could get hit by an unfriendly power or whatever. I mean, the technology to do it exists, and that's it. Then we're out of luck as far as knowing where, where anything is. So, yeah. And then Sydney is commenting, and then we'll make that the last comment, because it's 11.58, and I want to be respectful of people's time. And you know, we had one hour from, from 11 to noon. Isn't that how mistakes are found, though? Uh, by making the pro process go slowly. After all, at its most basic form, these are all created by humans, right? And humans make mistakes. And the computer will only do what it's told, right? And no less. And so if a human overlooks something, then, you know, exactly. And, and you know, this is why these 737-800 Super 8 jets crash into the ground, right? It's because somebody did not think about the fact that humans might get confused and not be able to turn the autopilot off when this plane suddenly starts shaking up and down. Because that was Boeing's initial excuse. It's like, well, you know, just push the button and turn it off. But that's really not a good enough <laughs> uh, excuse. So, uh, and, and so, yes, I mean, we make mistakes. The machines we build make mistakes. Even, even if machines become highly autonomous, right? They're only as good as the training they get from the environment, which is still machine training and machine learning. And they will make mistakes because again, you know, machines are not magical, right? They're, if they can learn by machine learning, it's still learning and it still relies on inputs and these inputs are imperfect. And so creating machines is certainly not a solution that's gonna create perfection, quite the contrary. Um, and so uh, you know, this problem that we need to make processes go fast enough that something actually is going to happen, but global warming, we can't wait for 50 years to find out. You know. uh, but we also need to realize that we need to make it slow enough that we understand the errors that occur in the process and that we can accommodate the human element you know, that, that people need to make a living, right? And we need to be respectful of that. We can't just say, well, this is a new thing we could do and then you're out of a job, sorry, right? I mean, that may be good for some other person right, to have that available, but it's not good for the person who's doing that job. And so this is, and these are questions that scientists need to be involved with, right? I mean, scientists have a tendency to disappear in the lab and go like, well, I'm figuring out this one thing and then, you know, somebody else is gonna worry about, you know, what the ramifications down the road of that are. And we live in a world now that's so interconnected that we really can't afford to do that. Uh, but we are used to it. I am used to this. I have to confess, right? I mean, they, they joke about the ivory towers, like the word that people used to use for this, right? Like up in this tower doing your thing and not worrying about what the consequences are. And I grew up as a scientist in that kind of atmosphere in the like 1980s. And, uh, but this is not something that's really going to work. And, and, and if scientists encounter backlash against their research, for instance, things like something gets published, as I said at the very beginning, uh, that shouldn't have been published by the press, right? Because it was half-baked. Uh, well, there's as much blame on the scientists as on anybody else in that food chain, right? Uh, as far as that happening. And, and, and these are things that need to be conveyed to the public, that you know, science is sort of a process that's imperfect as anything else, even though it can produce good results, you know, if it's, if it's done right. So. Okay, so uh, I think we'll stop there because it's, it's noon. And thank you, everyone. <laughs>